I'm excited to finally talk on what seems pertinent to our present convention, to elaborate moderately on what a person may do to foster both a conceptual and literal connection to the divine form via mysticism, otherwise known as practical Kabbalah. However, we have to start by asking ourselves, what remains prior to action? Rather, we may say, what are the means of proper preparation for practicing? In occultism and general theology, we find a few things. Specifically, ritualistic purification, provision of implements, and typically seclusion. More so, seclusion of oneself in a sacred space. After we cover these three points of preparation, we'll be discussing methodology, the literal practice or active engagement. I won't be talking about how to daven or pray, which is also considered a connection in this video, but I'm looking into a full discussion at a later date. Alright, so preparation as prior broken down into implements, sacred space, and purity, are strikingly talismanic visually and majorly symbolic. By that I mean that there are pre-existing sets of visuals and script easily conjoined in theory to modern Western magic. For example, while sigil construction produces an image of relative significance to some idea, phrase, or outcome, so too are the signs and symbols of the Kabbalah, albeit represented entirely by Hebrew and Aramaic letters and words for their traditional literary significance, rather than personally ascribed meaning. Of course, this is partially true, and that significance seems to shift with insight and present mental state of the individual, but this is expected and normal. With that, we can now ask, what implements are we referring to? Mostly, as this is specific to the Kabbalah, a tallit and tefillin, which are the implements of the practitioner just as a proper liturgical activity, along with sensory or external symbols like candles, incense, and meditative imagery. For example, meditative imagery would be like having a readily visible Kabbalistic image, upon which a person focuses their interest during engagement, but we'll cover this more extensively in the methodology portion of this talk. I suppose that sacred space is mostly self-explanatory, in that a person selects a single designated area to house these activities which is common to almost every single line of belief, be it religious or occult, so I won't elaborate on it any further. But now we come to purity, a more difficult area, which takes us into the Talmudic analysis on what is holy, known as Kodeshim, or holy things. In a strange way, these practices are likened unto the animal offerings which were historically given at the Temple of Solomon. Therefore, we must note what exactly makes an offering impure, thereby circumventing this issue since these methods have, in a sense, replaced the offerings, however are subject under similar limitations. Just before we discuss purity, you may ask, for what mystical purpose does a person seek to know aspects of the Talmud? The answer is found in the Zohar. Now, specifically from Volume Bet, Section 28, Subsection 77, we find, whoever reads and learns the six orders of the Mishnah, or the six partitions of the Talmudic law, knows how to arrange and connect with his master's unity, as is fitting. It is he who knows how to sanctify the holy name each day, always. So, the idea is that knowing the Talmudic passages allude to the laws of spiritual engagement by way of henosis, which was lightly addressed in the introductory video to Kabbalah. Alright, let's talk about active preparation and purity. Quoting from the Talmud, section 5, subsection Zebahim, folio 2.1, of my particular translation, we find, All offerings become invalid if, 1. They are received by one that is not a priest, 2. A priest is mourning his near of kin, 3. Had immersed himself because of uncleanness the same day, 4. Not clothed in proper raiment, and 5. Has not washed his hands and feet without specification of uncleanliness. So let's utilize these insights to develop an understanding of purity in practice. Segment 1 is by far the most difficult to perceive, however of the Talmud we find an explanation pertinent to our current endeavors. In section 4, uh, subsection Nezikin, folio 3.8, we find a quote yet paraphrased here, A priest precedes a Levite, a Levite an Israelite, and an Israelite any lesser or impure thing. But if an impure person is learned in the law, and a high priest is ignorant of the law, that impure person that is learned in the law precedes the high priest that is ignorant of it. Basically, while man himself is not labeled any manner of a Kohen, be a pure intention and elevation he may ultimately take on the likeness of the priest, who is in essence a magician. 
Now segment two is rather clear. Mourning or extended sadness can delay certain matters. However, we find in spaces such as prayer that mourning is an elevating factor. So for this case, let's just say that acting in some form of desperation isn't going to help you. Your mind needs to be in the right place to keep things moving properly. Segment three is a fun one, and that if we are in a place of uncleanness or impurity and submit ourselves to ritual immersion, fundamentally purification via a mikvah, which is a special bath, which while seeming underwhelming, is at root just that, taking a bath. And I'm not joking with you. It's actually part of the process. Now it states of the self-same day. In short, this is rooted from Leviticus 22.7, which states, When the sun goes down, he will be clean, and after that he may eat the sacred offerings, for they are his food. So if you bathe for ritualistic purposes, you are not good to go until the sun sets. Segment 4, or being clothed in proper raiment. While the priests of the temple had very specific raiment, we in these current endeavors may attribute this to the word daven, meaning pray. While davening, the raiment of a tallit and tefillin generates a spiritual conduit, as it is in essence a mimicry of the higher divine experiences of the patriarchs. So as you can procure these implements, the expectation is of greater insights and divine inspiration. Segment 5, and our final one, on purity, it says, has not washed his hands and feet. Let's assume you took on ritual immersion, i.e. took a bath, <laughs> The sun is set, and you're about to roll in some extreme devakut. Well then, don't forget to wash your hands and feet before starting. In fact, while not mentioned here, certain Talmudic sections also promote or demand being barefooted after this, which I'll admit is pretty nice on a wood floor. Alright, so now you're dressed to impress, clean, and ready to get started. Now what? Well, you've made it past preparation, hoping that if you have the implements, you're wearing them properly. Candles and incense burning, comfortable space, all in that sacred area set aside for this very purpose. So let's discuss what we're actually going to do. I'm going to provide a few methodologies and explanations, and you can select one that you think will work best for you, and take it from there. We'll cover Kavanah, Yichurim, Linear Ascension, and lastly, Devakut. In tandem with the understandings we find in simple Western magic, we must address Kavanah. This topic deals with the matter of intention with a hidden section. Again, the portion of intention is similar to magic, and the word means intention or sincerity of feeling. It brings us to the question of why are we performing these activities? Why are we engaging in practical Kabbalah? Are we hoping to garner something of and for ourselves, or hoping to foster a connection to the divine forms? Which, while we do gain from this, this seemingly trivial result of the interaction should not be the primary focus of it. Rather, the connection itself is the primary focus, to learn by way of furthering that unification between ourselves to the higher spaces, which is a function of tikkun, or rectification. In esoteric practice, kavanah is like the forefather to the other three methods, a cornerstone if you will, and that we begin to concentrate on the letters, words, and divine names. We concentrate on them in hopes of garnering some insight by way of what may seem like divine intervention in the moment. Overall, the best thing that can be done is to focus comfortably, to remain calm, to think openly, and the rest will work itself out. I will say it's good to have a small understanding of the characters before stepping into this, because it'll make way for depth of experience, and that you'll see or be open to more correlations than you would have otherwise. Now that we've got the basic concept, we come to Yichurim, or the meditative practice strongly inspired by Isaac Luria, the Arizal. For such a practice, which is an expansion on the esoteric side of Kavanah, will endeavor to permute, interlock, and meditate on the letters typically of the divine names. This is normally supplemented with speech, in which the names, while many you will find are not spoken, are spelled out verbally. The most popular of which is the conjugal name of yod heh vav -He and Adonai. However, we may do more with this. We may reasonably imagine that each of the four worlds has in essence a likeness of yod heh vav -He and Adonai, or Zir Anpin and Shekhinah, who are actually one and the same. Hence, Hashem shall be one. Therefore, the theory directs the practice, so we can join those names following the metaphorical usage of unity via human understanding, 
and can produce the eight-letter divine name of Yod Aleph He Dalet Vav Nun He Yod, which I personally used in my first ever Yihun to some immense success. However, it doesn't end there. We may consider that this is the union of Yod He Vav He and Adonai specific to the fourth world, that of Asiya, by which we then unite that conjugal form unto Adonai of the third world, then to Yod He Vav He of the third world and so on upwards to Atziluth. In this instance, while we may not realize it, this is akin to ascending the middle pillar. And not that we as people literally move up it, but there is a mystical symbology between the action and conjoining these forms, upwards on the tree of life, the primary Kabbalistic symbol. Now we come to the third topic, one which the Hermetic Kabbalists seem to love so much, that of linear ascension. Linear Ascension is a subset derived from Moshe Cordovero, otherwise known as the Ramak. In some ways, it is actually a semi-misunderstanding or new philosophy from Westerners derived from Pardes Rimonim, or in English Orchard of Pomegranates, that was mildly comprehended and shifted into a bottom-up line of thinking, while Pardes Rimonim centers its first four chapters on the Divine's generative aspects, the significance of the Tense Faroth, and their interactions we find in Linear Ascension and Oddity, uh, a reflex or desire in man to conceptually rework his mind up the aspects of the Sferoth, which common Kabbalists typically call ascending or working with the Tree of Life. This is quite easy to explain metaphysically, starting with general occultism, then later Judaic mysticism. First of the general, quoting Manly Palmer Hall, Pythagoras said that the Universal Creator had formed two things in his own image. The first was the cosmic system, with the myriads of suns, moons, and planets. The second was man, in whose nature the entire universe existed in miniature. Thus the macro to micro connection. So you see that in this format, it's rather easy to associate the corporeal existence as in some way a miniature revelation of the spiritual form. Anyways, let's move on to Judaic mysticism and consider the statements of Rabbi Yehuda Ashlag. More properly, Baal HaSulam, after making a personal declaration and asking a question. The declaration begins as such. We may note that man exists at the base of the tree, or by some understanding his form exists within Malkuth, the kingdom of Asiya. However, his means, rather his purpose, if considered as tikkun or rectification, to keep the mitzvot, the commandments, whereby it brings pleasure to the creator that made him, and furthermore by his choice, a pure intention or proper kavanah, we assume his soul elevated. Yet, by what purpose would anything of the sort be allowed conceptually? It is, quoting now from Baal HaSulam, the soul of man is a part of God himself and that there is no difference between the soul and God, just that God is the whole and the soul is a part of God. Assuredly, this topic could go on for hours, but I have to cut it short with only the pieces that are necessary. So to finalize the practical ideas behind this, we then meditate, much like Yehudim, on the interrelation of the metaphorical, the anthropomorphic attributions of the divine form, thereby garnering deeper insights into the topic at hand. Yet there is an extension, and that the spiritual form of oneself is typically considered, as it relates to the Sferoth, the aspects of the divine form, how they're tied together, how they're traversed amidst their interaction, even to the conceptual states of spirit and the literal states of mind brought about by particular revelations. Of course, at this point, there are now different traditions, different depictions of the tree, different avenues or roots, and different explanations or foundations to the most minor segments. I suggest one thing, peruse the tradition, the hermetic, etc., and find what works for you, as long as you can reasonably declare it worthwhile. As a side note, this practice is commonly supplemented with the Etzheim, or Tree of Life imagery, whereby looking for the deeper correlations that may often be overlooked leads to deeper insights. For example, I had no idea that the letter Aleph was the literal center of the tree until earnestly staring at the tree for what may have been 40 minutes. It seems trivial, I know, yet the implications of this clarity are expansive. We're finally on to our last piece, Devekut which is realistically just the open-ended side to the three methods we've already analyzed. Devakut is most simply a meditative state brought about through prayer 
proper action via the mitzvot, extensive study, and so on. It's the true meditative state, and that it induces a sort of trance, by which the individual garners deeper insights and revelations. Now with that being said, you might understand why I put it last, because it is essentially the basic interpretation, or rather the pinnacle of understanding, of the other three methods. The entire concept of practical Kabbalah is, at core, much like a transcendent meditative state, a moment of spiritual and mental clarity, which is why Devekut is considered closeness to God. This closeness is characterized by a phrase, quoting Baal HaSulam, you are known through your actions, which is studying the interrelated nature of the tree of life, divine names, and so on, in tandem with right action and proper intention, thereby the person is considered closer by way of proper alignment. How is that related to the quotation? Well, because the analysis of the Torah has birthed the Kabbalah, along with the oral tradition, thereby they are an analysis of the actions of the divine and subsequently studying them is a closeness. In ethics, Ashlag relates this to a concept, receiving in order to give, quoting a nice tone to end such a topic. Alright everyone, thank you very much for joining me, and I hope you enjoyed this brief yet hopefully useful video. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.